Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Walters Kluwer, a warm welcome to our speaker and attendees of this anatomy webinar under our new medical age series. We will have over six more or maybe more such webinars on different topics of anatomy in forthcoming months. Our topic today is blood supply of the brain and spinal cord. And our speaker today is Dr. Kumar Satish Ravi, who is Professor of Anatomy, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Rishikesh. He is also editor in chief of National Journal of Clinical Anatomy. He is also additional proctor and assistant controller of examination and ex sub dean academics and assistant dean academics. Also, we will be taking all questions at the end of the webinar and I request you, and I request you to please post all your questions in the Q&A panel of this event. We will try to address the maximum questions at the end of the session. Please also provide your feedback via link which we will post in the chat section of the webinar. Now we begin our session and I hand over this to Dr. Ravi and I request him to please start sharing his screen. Dr. Ravi, it's over to you, sir. I'm giving you the rights. Dr. Ravi, please unmute yourself, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, one and all. First of all, I would like to thank each uh, one of you for taking your pieces time and uh, participating in this Medical Age series. I would like to thank the Volters Clover for initiating and uh, taking this initiative to start this medical age series uh, during this pandemic which is definitely uh, the world is facing the worst time after the world war second you can say right and i'm grateful to mr ravi shukla uh, who was kind enough to invite me for this guest lecture though it was supposed to be the first guest lecture of the medical uh, age series but unfortunately it couldn't happen because of the, some technical issues but still uh, i appreciate uh, his efforts that Today also, we are able to uh, again conduct this webinar on the same topic, that is the blood supply of the brain and the spinal cord. So, as I said in the past, whenever I think about this blood supply of the brain and the spinal cord, the very first phase which comes to my mind is a neurosurgeon, right? And uh, he's the founder director of AIMS Rishikesh, uh, Professor Raj Kumar. He is, an, uh, is a neurosurgeon of international repute. Whenever he used to attend a meeting with us, he always used to say that uh, until unless my hands are soaked with the blood, I don't feel like a surgeon. I truly appreciate. Uh, why? Because until unless a surgeon performs a surgery, we cannot say that he or she is a surgeon, right? But at the same time, we say that uh, the surgeon who performs a bloodless surgery or uh, I mean to say about this bloodless surgery uh, while performing the procedure the minimum blood loss uh, should be there so in those conditions we say that the okay the surgery was excellent and the surgeon was incredible so this this is how uh, uh, it is related to the loss of the blood supply and the how this blood supply of any uh, organ be it uh, the brain or the spinal cord or any of the viscera is important so when I uh, talk about this blood supply, right, I recall uh, the word of the Michio Kaku who said that human brains has 100 billion neurons and each neuron is connected to 10,000 other neurons. So sitting on our shoulders is the most complicated object in the known universe. So what I wanted to say that the brain is a complex organ or an intricate organ, you can say, that controls every process that regulates our body, be it, uh, you say, the eating, breathing, uh, the motor skills, vision, etc. And a broadly acknowledged field is that the brain receives around 15 to 20 percent of the total cardiac output. Apart from that, if we say if the blood supply of the brain is interrupted for more than, you say, 10 seconds, uh, it causes unconsciousness. And if it is interrupted for more than a few minutes, right, then uh, there will be irreversible brain damage. Uh, 
the damage starts if the blood supply is stopped for four minutes and the brain damage, the irreversible change will complete if it is approximately 10 minutes, you say. So I'll start my talk with a case scenario. A 60-year-old male presented uh, to emergency with history of loss of consciousness for a brief period, followed by slurring of speech. He also complains of weakness of left half of the body. There was no complaint of vomiting uh, and the blurring of vision. And he is a known case of diabetic, uh, you say, uh, and, and he was under the medication. So this is a case of a stroke. And if we see uh, one of the co most common case you will encounter when you will go to the emergency, right? And for further management, we need to point out the area of the lesion where which area of the brain is affected. So when someone suffers from a stroke, you say uh, 1.9 million nerve cells die each minute and resulting in the loss of 15 billion synapses and 7.5 uh, miles of nerve cells, you say. So this tells us the importance of the blood supply of the brain. Now, uh, I, I don't know that in how many medical institutions this head and neck or the neuroanatomy has been started. So I remember the word of one of my mentor. He said, uh, we need brain to understand the brain, right? And when we discussed, when I was uh, uh, writing an article on this related to the neuroanatomy, so sir was mentioning that we need brain to understand the brain. And when you are writing about the brain, how much brain you need, you understand. So similarly, just I would like to, uh, I wanted to say over here that to understand the blood supply of the brain in the spinal cord, we must know, we, we must know the various components of the central nervous system, and we should have a brief idea about this cerebrum or the spinal cord so that we can understand the blood supply of the brain and the spinal cord. So over here, if you see there's components of the central nervous system, this is the cerebrum over here. Inferiorly, you can see post. Uh, inferiorly and posteriorly, you have this cerebellum, and below that, if you can appreciate over here, this is the spinal cord. So, in this picture, this is the cerebral hemisphere. Inferiorly, we can make out this is the cerebellar hemisphere, and then over here, we can make out this is the brain stem. The brain stem it consists of the midbrain. Superiorly, we have the spons, and then inferiorly, we have the medulla oblongata. This medulla oblongata will continue inferiorly as the spinal cord. And when we talk about this spinal cord, it extends from C1 to L1. C stands for the cervical vertebra, whereas L stands for the lumbar vertebra. So I said that this spinal cord, it extends from C1 to L1. In case of the children, it extends from C1 to L3. Why I'm mentioning, giving emphasis on about the children, because uh, very common procedure we perform uh, in the emergency. And that procedure we say is the lumbar puncture. So lumbar puncture in case of the children, the preferred site will be between L4 and L5. Whereas in case of uh, adult, you say the preferred site will be between L3 and L4. Why? Because of the uh, length of the spinal cord, right? In say, in case of adult, I said it extends up to L1. Whereas in case of the Children, I said it extends up to L3. So just to avoid injury, in case of the children, we perform this lumbar puncture between L4 and L5, whereas in case of the adult, we'll perform between L3 and L4. Now, we will see the difference divisions and the subdivision of the, uh, you say, the brain. If you see in the slide over here, there are three divisions of the brain. We have the forebrain, we have the midbrain over here, and then we have the hindbrain. Now, this further forebrain is subdivided as telencephalon and the diencephalon. From the telencephalon, we have the cerebrum, whereas from the diencephalon, we have thalamus, epithalamus, hypothalamus, subthalamus. Then similarly, when we talk about this midbrain, from the mesencephalon, we have the midbrain, whereas from the hindbrain, the subdivisions are the metencephalon and the myelencephalon. From the metencephalon, we have the pons and the cerebellum, whereas from the myelencephalon, Cephalon, we have the medulla oblongata. Now, when we see in this slide over here, this is a picture of the cerebral hemisphere. 
when we talk about a cerebrum, uh, a cere cerebrum has three poles. This is the frontal pole over here, uh, we can say. And posteriorly, we have this occipital pole. So I said there are three poles in the cerebrum. We have the frontal pole, which is anteriorly. We have occipital pole, which is posteriorly. And then infinitely, if you can appreciate over here, this is the temporal pole. Apart from three poles, we have the different surfaces in the cerebrum. We have the suprolateral surface, if you can appreciate over here. This is the suprolateral surface. Over here, we have the medial surface. And inferiorly, we have the inferior surface. So there are three surfaces. Why I'm uh, discussing over here? Because when you see over here, there are some elevations are there and there are some uh, uh, depressions are there. These depressions are known as sulci, whereas these elevations are known as gyri. So there are some chief sulci. Uh, we can appreciate over here, this is the central sulcus over here, and this is the lateral sulcus, right? And over here, towards the medial surface, if you can appreciate over here, this is the parieto occipital sulcus. The parieto occipital sulcus, why I am showing, showing you on the medial surface, because this parieto occipital sulcus will be chiefly present on the medial surface. Only a portion of this parieto occipital sulcus you will find on the uh, this supralateral surface towards the supramedial border. So to uh, differentiate, to divide, or to have the different lobes of the cerebrum, what we need to do that we have the central sulcus anterior to the central sulcus and superior to this lateral sulcus, we have this frontal lobe. I hope I'm clear. Posterior to this central sulcus, and we need to draw an imaginary line from this parieto occipital sulcus to the pre occipital notch, which is present on the uh, infralateral border. So, this pre occipital notch will be present five centimeter from this occipital pole, right? I said this pre occipital notch, notch you will appreciate on the infralateral border from the uh, five centimeter from the occipital pole. So we need to draw an imaginary line from this parieto occipital sulcus to the pre occipital notch. We need to draw another imaginary line from this lateral sulcus. Now, as I said, this lateral sulcus is there. There are three remi of the lateral sulcus. One we have the anterior remi, another we have the ascending remi, and then we have the posterior remi. Now, if we can appreciate in this diagram, this is the anterior remi. Over here we have the ascending remi, and this is the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus. Now, I said we need to draw an, another imaginary line which you need to extend from this posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus to the first imaginary line which you have drawn from the preoccipital sulcus to the preoccipital knot. So the area, the reason which is anterior to this first imaginary line, superior to the lat posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus and the second imaginary line and the posterior to this central sulcus. This portion, if we can appreciate, this is the parietal lobe. Now, inferior to this lateral sulcus and anterior to this first imaginary line, this lobe, if we can appreciate, is the temporal lobe. And posterior to the first imaginary line, which extends from the parieto occipital sulcus to the preoccipital notch, this is the occipital lobe. So this way, we have seen that there are four lobes present in the cerebral hemisphere. Now, some of the structures which you can appreciate over here in the medial surface of the cerebrum, over here, as I said, this is the parieto occipital sulcus. Over here, we have this calcarine sulcus. So this is the occipital lobe. Over here, we have this parietal lobe. This is the paracentral lobule. This is the frontal lobe. Over here, we'll have, if you can appreciate, this is the corpus callosum, which is the largest commissural fiber. This is the corpus callosum. We have rostrum, genu, the body, and the posteriorly, we have the splenium. This is the lateral ventricle. Over here, we have this thalamus, the two uh, thalamus, the thalami will be interconnected by this interthalamic adhesion. Over here, we have this midbrain. Then inferiorly, we have this pons, and then we have the medulla oblongata, which will continue as the spinal cord. Now, over here, you can appreciate this is the cerebellum. So this is all a brief about this cerebrum or the brain. By this diagram, if you can appreciate over here, right, uh, this is a typical 
photograph by photograph, so seeing the photograph only you can make out uh, the person is having a heart attack. So I would like to suggest by this uh, uh, this presentation over here or uh, in the stock that every one of us, right, whoever, whoever is nearby, be it our, uh, the maid, the supporting staff, PN, anyone, everyone must be trained uh, about this basic life support. When someone is uh, having heart attack, the nearest person will be either the PN, the staff, the maid. If they are trained for the basic life support, they can give the CPR and then the person, the life of the individual can be saved. So what I wanted to say over here that as in case of the uh, this myocardial infarction or the uh, this heart attack, uh, we give this immediate treatment, right? Similarly, similar to the this myocardial infarction, if we give uh, the same uh, immediate treatment in case of the cerebrovascular accident, uh, then I wanted to say that if we give immediate treatment, the management, so the early intervention or you say the management will definitely uh, 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 save the life of the patient by and not only that, it will reduce the morbidity and the mortality of the individual of the patient. I wanted to say that uh, if you see this thrombosis or you say the embolism or the hemorrhage, these are the third most common cause of the death. And whatever the neurological deficits are there, that uh, depends on the site of the lesion. And uh, to know the site of the lesion, because until unless we know the site of the lesion, we cannot give the management or the treatment. So the site of the lesion is important. And when we talk about this uh, neurological admissions in the emergency or in the ward, the uh, the maximum uh, the admission is because of the uh, this neurological admission and in that neurological admission if you say the it is all because of the uh, this disorder of the uh, blood supply so i wanted to say that the blood supply of the brain is very important because of this neurological deficits uh, because of that the patients are getting admitted in the hospital and because of this lesion in the different reason only uh, these uh, deficits are there. So I wanted to say that brain is not only a complex or an intricate organ, but it is also a highly vascular organ. You can appreciate over here in this diagram and it has high metabolic activity due to the constant neuronal activity. And if we talk about this arterial blood to the brain, it provides the oxygen and glucose to the neurons. So whatever neurons are there, it gets uh, the nourishment or you say the oxygen or the glucose because of the blood, the arterial blood. The neurons in the brain, if we say, these are more sensitive to the oxygen deprivation than compared to the other tissues in the body. Now, uh, though this brain, if you talk about, it constitutes only 2% of the total body weight, but it receives uh, uh, approximately, you say 15 to 20% of the total cardiac output, as I said previously, and it consumes approximately 20% of the total oxygen which is used by our body. So any event resulting in compromise in the, uh, you say the blood supply to the brain, it can lead to the transit or you say the permanent damage to the neurons and which uh, in turn you can say that it will lead to the various functional deficits and even to the death of the individual. So we will see how this organ is supplied by the various blood vessels. Now, when we talk about this blood vessels of the brain, basically there are two systems. One, we have the carotid system and another we have the vertebrovascular system. Or we say the anterior circulation and then we have the posterior circulation. So, uh, basically this brain is supplied by a pair of the uh, vertebral, vertebral arteries, that is the right and the left uh, vertebral arteries and then we have a pair of the internal carotid artery that is the right and left internal carotid artery. Over here in this diagram if you can appreciate uh, we have this ascending aorta which comes from the left ventricle of the heart. This ascending aorta at the level of the external angle will continue anteriorly as the arch of aorta. So over here in this diagram you can appreciate this is the arch of aorta. From this arch of aorta, we have three main branches. 
from the right side, from right to left, if we see, the very first branch we will appreciate is the brachiocephalic trunk. Then we have the left common carotid artery, and then we have the left subclavian artery. This brachiocephalic trunk will further divide into two. One we have is the right common carotid artery. You can appreciate this. This is the right common carotid artery. And then we have the right subclavian artery, right? Now this, when we see this right subclavian artery or the left subclavian artery, it is further divided into three parts, the pre-scalene, the scalene, and the post-scalene. Means this subclavian artery is divided into three parts by the scalenous anterior. So we are concerned over here about the vertebral artery. So the vertebral artery comes from the first part of the subclavian artery. So over here, you can see this is the vertebral artery, the right and the left vertebral artery, which comes from the right and left subclavian artery respectively. Now, when we see this common carotid artery, and now this common carotid artery, what happens that it comes from this brachiocephalic trunk towards the right side, whereas towards the left side, uh, it is a direct branch from the arch of horta. It ascends upwards at the upper border of the thyroid cartilage, what happens that this common carotid artery will divide into two. One is the external carotid artery and another is the internal carotid artery. So we are concerned over here with the internal carotid artery, which you can appreciate. So what I wanted to say that over here, we have this up at the upper border of the thyroid cartilage, this common carotid artery will divide into the external and the internal carotid artery. Over here, you can appreciate the internal carotid artery and then we have the external carotid artery. Now, when we talk about this vertebral artery, you can appreciate over here, this vertebral artery will ascend upwards. We'll see in the coming slide over here, right? Now, in this slide, you can appreciate over here, this is the subclavian artery. I said from the very first part of the subclavian artery, this, the vertebral artery arises. So, it is divided into the four, four parts. The first, second, third and the fourth part. The first part will be uh, from the origin of the subclavian artery as soon as it arises from the subclavian artery and it enters into the foramen transverse cerium of the uh, sixth cervical vertebra. So this part will be the first part. From the uh, foramen transverse cerium of the uh, sixth cervical vertebra to the foramen transverse cerium of the second uh, the cervical vertebra will be the second part of the vertebral uh, artery. Then from this second uh, foramen, transverse, uh, foramen transverse area of the second cervical vertebra to this, you say the lateral rectus capitis, it goes towards laterally and then it enters uh, into the cranial cavity through this foramen magnum. So this part, if you can see, appreciate over here is the third part. And the fourth part, which is the intracranial part or which, which you will find in the intradural. So this, if you can appreciate when it enters uh, via this foramen magnum, that part is the fourth part of the vertebral artery. So this over here, if you can see this loop course uh, of the vertebral artery around the lateral mass of the uh, atlas, you say, the atlas, or you say the first cervical vertebra. The first cervical vertebra, it is also called as atlas, whereas the second cervical vertebra, it is also called as axis. So we have this uh, lateral mass of the first cervical vertebra or the atlas. So because when you see the course over here of this vertebral artery, there is a looping course of the vertebral artery around the lateral mass of the uh, this uh, atlas vertebra, which helps in the damping down of the arterial pulsation within the cranial cavity. Now, we will see the different branches from this uh, vertebral artery if you see over here in this diagram also you can appreciate the different parts of the vertebral artery the first part second part the third part and the fourth part so when we see this vertebral artery from the cerebral part if you say the from the fourth part of the uh, vertebral artery there will be five branches we have the anterior spinal artery, we have the posterior spinal artery, we have, uh, you say, the small meningeal artery, we have the medullary branches, and apart from that, we have the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So when we talk about this anterior spinal artery, over here, if you see, I said that 
we have this vertebral artery, it ascends uh, upwards, enters via this foramen magna. And then when you see this pons at the lower border of the pons, what happens? The two sides of the vertebral artery joins and forms a basilar artery. So basilar artery you will be uh, getting on the ventral group, which is present on the ventral aspect of the pons. So we'll see over here, I said the very first branch which you will be getting from this vertebral artery is the anterior sp spinal artery. Anterior spinal artery, when we see, it will be a, a small branch which comes from the two sides of the vertebral artery, that is from the right and the left uh, vertebral artery. What happens that it descends in front of the uh, middle of Langata, you can say, and it unites in the, with the, uh, you say the fellow of the opposite side, means the right and left will join together and will form uh, the anterior spinal artery and it will descend into the anterior longitudinal fissure uh, which is present in the spinal cord. And this anterior spinal artery will be supplying the anterior two third part of the spinal cord, which we will be discussing when we'll discuss the blood supply of the spinal cord. So I said that uh, it unites with the opposite side of the vertebral artery and at the level of the lower end of the olive, you say it forms a single median trunk, which travels, uh, descends down in the median longitudinal fissure and forms the anterior spinal artery. The second branch which you can appreciate over here is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Now, uh, if you see this posterior inferior cerebellar artery, this is the largest branch of the fourth part of the vertebral artery, you say, right? And it arises from the lower uh, end of the olive. And it uh, uh, back, it goes backwards around the, uh, you say, the medulla oblongata, and then it ascends in the, uh, in the pontomedullary medullary junction, you say. So when you will see this, uh, this uh, posterior inferior cerebellar artery, obviously, because it goes towards the pons and the middle of lungata, it will supply the middle of lungata and the uh, posterior inferior part of the cerebellum also. That we will discuss later on. Then we have the uh, another branch we call it as the posterior spinal artery. So this posterior spinal artery, it arises from the vertebral artery and sometimes what happens that it may arise from the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. It passes downwards on the posterior uh, surface of the spinal cord. Uh, I wanted to say over here that this anterior spinal artery, when we say it is one in number, whereas the posterior spinal artery will be two in number. So it, it will be the branch from the vertebral artery, or sometimes it may be a branch of the posterior uh, inferior cerebellar artery. So it divides into two branches and along the, you say the medial side, uh, and the other along the lateral side of the uh, dorsal roots of the spinal nerves, you will find uh, this posterior spinal artery. Then I said we have the small meningeal artery. So this meningeal artery will be supplying the dura meter of the posterior cranial fossa. Apart from that, I said that we have the medullary arteries as well, which are small minute vessels, and that will be supplying the medulla oblongata. So there are five branches from the vertebral artery. I said the meningeal branch, the medullary branch, then we have the anterior spinal artery, we have the posterior spinal artery, and then I said the largest branch from the vertebral artery, I said that is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which is the largest branch of the fourth uh, part of the vertebral artery. Now, in this diagram, if you can appreciate over here, I said that two sides of the vertebral artery, the right and left are, uh, uh, vertebral artery, it joins at the lower border of the pons. Over here, you can appreciate that the two vertebral artery joins and forms the basilar artery. So this you will find, as I said, that there is a basilar group on the ventral aspect of the, uh, somewhat was typing something. Please, uh, I'll take your questions later on, right? Okay, so what I said that we have the right and left uh, vertebral artery. These two joins at the lower border of the Pons, and then it forms the basilar artery, which is present on the ventral aspect of the pons on the basilar groove. So it, you can appreciate over here, again, as we have seen that uh, from the vertebral artery, we had the five branches. So you can appreciate over here, this the basilar artery, it at the upper border of the pons, it divides into two. 
Okay. So at I said that at the upper part of the pons, it terminates, it divides into two uh, branches. That is the posterior cerebral artery. So you can see over here, these are the terminating branches of the basilar artery. These are the posterior cerebral artery. Apart from that, over here, we have the pontine branches. Then we have the superior cerebellar artery. And then we have this labyrinthine artery. This labyrinthine artery, uh, it may be the branch from the basilar artery. Sometimes what happens that it may be branch of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. And then over here, you can appreciate this uh, long branch over here. That is the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So when we talk about this small, uh, long or short pontine branches, these are the numerous number will be there and it will be slender fine thread like structures will be there. And we say these are the paramedian vessels which will pierce the pons and these will supply the pons. So that, that's uh, why the name is given the pontine artery. Then I said we have the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. This arises close to the lower border of the pons. Over here you can appreciate at the lower border of the pons, uh, these two vertebral artery joints and forms. And at the same point, you can appreciate over here that this anterior inferior cerebellar artery will be arising. What happens that it will arise from this basilar artery and then it will form a loop over the flocculus of the cerebellum. And then what happens that it will uh, go into the internal acoustic meatus, right? Along And then what will happen that uh, we have the seventh and the eighth cranial nerve. Seventh, that is the uh, facial nerve. And eighth, we have the vestibulocochlear nerve, or we say the auditory nerve. So it will be lying below this seventh and the eighth cranial nerve. And then what will happen that it will exit with this internal acoustic meatus. And then what will happen Then it will supply the anterolateral portion of the inferior portion of the, uh, you say, the cerebellum. Then I said this labyrinthine artery, when we see over here, this is the labyrinthine artery. Uh, what will happen that it arises, I said, it arises from the either the basilar artery or it arises from the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. What happens that once it arises, it, uh, uh, it goes into where uh, the, uh, you say the internal ear, it supplies the internal ear. And we say that this, uh, you, you can say that this lambrindan artery or you say the internal acoustic artery, these are the end artery. There will be no further branching over there. So then apart from that, you can appreciate over here, just inferior means uh, before this basilar artery uh, terminates into the posterior cerebellar, uh, cerebral artery, it gives the superior cerebellar artery. The name itself suggests the superior cerebellar artery means it will be supplying the superior surface of the cerebellum. So it uh, arises uh, or it originates at the upper border of the, you say, the pons, right? And then what happens that it runs, uh, runs laterally below the oculomotor nerve, that is the third cranial nerve. And uh, between the artery or this, uh, you say, uh, this uh, superior cerebellar artery and you say this posterior cerebral artery, you can appreciate over here, right? Uh, it will go and it will supply the cerebral peduncle uh, and then it will supply the superior aspect of the uh, this cerebellum. So this is all about the various branches of the basilar artery. I repeat, there are five branches are there. The terminal branches are the posterior cerebral artery. Then we have the superior cerebellar artery. Then we have the pontine branches. And then we have the labyrinthine artery or the internal acoustic artery. And then we have the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Now, now we will see about the internal carotid artery. If we see over here, I said that internal carotid artery is uh, a branch from the common carotid artery. Or uh, we can say this common carotid artery divides into two, that is the external carotid artery and the internal carotid artery. Over here in this diagram, you can appreciate this is the uh, common carotid artery and there is a dilatation over here, right? And uh, this common carotid artery at the upper border of the thyroid cartilage, it divides into two. One is the external carotid artery and another we have is the internal carotid artery. So what happens that this internal carotid artery, it enters uh, into the cranial fossa, the middle cranial fossa via this carotid canal. Now what happens 
that when you see this internal carotid artery, it is a branch from this common carotid artery. It enters via this carotid canal, right? And then what will happen that it will appear where you have this foramen of uh, foramen lacerum. And then it goes anteriorly towards the medially. We have this cavernous sinus and then it goes upwards. What will happen that we have this anterior clinoid process over here and it will be medial to this anterior clinoid process. And then what will happen that this uh, internal carotid artery will pierce uh, into uh, the dura mater and will uh, enter into the subarachnoid space. So I wanted to say over here that when we see this internal carotid artery, it will give the, there are the different parts of this internal carotid artery. We have the cervical part, uh, which is in the cervical region. Then uh, when it enters into the carotid canal, the petrous part of the, uh, you say the temporal bone, this is the petrous part. And then when it passes through this cavernous sinus, that portion we call it as the cavernous part. And then when it enters into, uh, why, uh, why piercing this dura mater, when it enters into the subarachnoid space, it is called as the cerebral part. Now, when we see this cerebral part of the internal carotid artery over here, you can appreciate in this diagram, this is the common carotid artery. We have, we have this external carotid artery. We have this internal carotid artery. And it when it enters into this middle cranial fossa over here, we will see the different branches from this internal carotid artery. Now, over here, I would like to give emphasis that as you have seen the branches of the vertebral artery, we have seen the branches of the basilar artery. Similarly, we have the five branches uh, from the internal carotid artery from the cerebral part. And these are the ophthalmic artery. This ophthalmic artery, which is uh, the very first, if you see over here, this carotid siphon is there, a shift from there only, uh, this ophthalmic artery arises, and then it enters into the, uh, you say, uh, through the superior orbital fissure, we have this optic canal, through this optic canal, it enters into the orbit. And then a very important branch from this ophthalmic artery I would like to mention over here is the central uh, artery of retina. Why I am giving emphasis on this central artery of retina? Because whenever there is an embolism, right, in this uh, carotid circulation, what will happen that through this carotid artery, it will go to the ophthalmic artery and uh, Immediately, because the central artery of retina is an end artery, it will go into the central uh, uh, artery of retina and it will block uh, and it will lead to the blindness. So that uh, the central artery of retina is one of the important branch from this ophthalmic artery. So one branch, we have the ophthalmic artery. Then apart from that, we have this anterior uh, choroidal artery. So over here, you can appreciate this branch. This is the anterior choroidal, choroidal artery, which goes posteriorly over here. Then what will happen that the name itself suggests this anterior choroidal artery, it will go uh, add, uh, to the choroid plexus. We have this inferior horn of the lateral ventricle, and then it will go and it will form the choroid plexus. It will supply there. So one branch, we have the ophthalmic artery. Then another, we have the anterior choroidal artery. The third branch, if you can appreciate over here, this is the posterior communicating artery. Now, the name itself suggests the posterior communicating artery. Posterior communicating artery will go towards the posterior aspect and this posterior communicating artery will communicate with the, the posterior system. That is, the when we see this basilar artery, the basilar artery is dividing into two. That is the posterior uh, right and left posterior cerebral artery. So, this posterior communicating artery will communicate with the posterior cerebral artery of the vertebral basilar system, right? So we have this posterior communicating artery. So one, we have the ophthalmic artery. Another, we have the posterior communicating artery. The third one I said is the anterior choroidal artery. Now, the main two branches, if you can appreciate over here, this uh, internal carotid artery, what will happen that it will terminate by dividing into two branches. The larger branch, we call it as the middle cerebral artery and the smaller branch, which you can appreciate over here is the anterior cerebral artery. So over here, you can uh, appreciate this anterior cerebral artery and we have the middle cerebral artery. So there are five branches from this internal carotid artery. One, 
the ophthalmic artery, which arises from this carotid siphon, right, enters uh, through this optic canal, will supply the eye, right? And then we have the posterior communicating artery, which will communicate with the, uh, the vertebrobasilar system, that is the posterior cerebral artery. The third one, I said anterior choroidal artery, which will go and with, uh, uh, will end in the choroid plexus. And then uh, you say, uh, because of the uh, long subarachnoid course of this arachnoid, Art, uh, this uh, anterior coronal artery, you say, uh, it will. Uh, it is often re referred as the artery of the cerebral thrombosis. Very important clinically, it is when we will discuss uh, this. You say the internal capsule. That time also we will uh, discuss about these artery. Then apart from that, I said we have this anterior cerebral artery, which is the small terminal branch from the internal carotid artery. So it will go and it will supply as i said there are basically three cerebral arteries are there one is the posterior cerebral artery which is a branch from the uh, basilar artery then the two cerebral branches which, uh, are chiefly from the uh, internal carotid artery these are the middle cerebral artery which is the larger branch and then we have the anterior cerebral artery which is the small terminal branch from the internal carotid artery and these three branches the anterior middle and the posterior cerebral arteries will be supplying the cerebrum or the brain basically we see so we will see over here now when we see this circle of willis right this circle of willis over here you can appreciate this is the basilar artery which is dividing into two that is the posterior cerebral artery we have this posterior communicating artery which is coming from the internal carotid artery then if we can appreciate over here this is the internal carotid artery from there we have this middle cerebral artery which is going towards the uh, you say the lateral stem of the lateral sulcus over here you can appreciate this is the middle cerebral artery and anteriorly if you can appreciate over here the small terminal branch this is the anterior cerebral artery now when we talk about this circle of willis wha what is the significance of this circle of willis when we see this circle of willis it is basically located in the interpeduncular fossa. Now, when we say this interpeduncular fossa, anteriorly it is bounded by this optic chiasma over here, you can say. And then we have this anterolaterally, if you can appreciate, we have this optic tract, right? And then posteriorly, we have this upper border of the pons. You can appreciate this is the upper border of the pons, and this is the lower border of the pons. So I was discussing about this. Uh, boundary of this interpeduncular fossa, I said anteriorly we have this optic chiasma, right? And then anterolaterally, I said we have the optic tract. Posteriorly, we have the upper border of the pons. And then the laterally, if you see over here, postural laterally, we have the cerebral peduncle will be there, right? So this is the interpeduncular fossa. And in the uh, interpeduncular system, this circle of willis is located, which is formed by the two system, the inter, the carotid system and the vertebro basilar system. The beauty of this circle of villus is that usually what happens that there will be the blood which is circulating in these two system. Either you talk about the right system or the left system. The right system is formed by the right posterior cerebral artery, the right posterior communicating artery, the right anterior cerebral artery, and then we have this anterior communicating artery which is present between the two anterior cerebral artery. So usually what will happen that there will be no mixing of the blood between the either you say uh, from the right side to the left side or you say from the anterior side to the posterior side. So basically it helps in the collateral circulation. So whenever uh, some of the artery will be uh, damaged, will be injured, then what will happen <coughs> that the suppose if there is a uh, damage uh, this uh, left side anterior cerebral artery will be damaged right so what will happen that the blood will come from the opposite side and then it will circulate similarly vice versa i can say so that is the beauty you can say then if we see over here uh, next you can see appreciate in this over here we have in the circle of willis uh, over here you can appreciate this is the anterior cerebral artery then we have this is the anterior 
uh, communicating artery between the two anterior cerebral artery, the same diagram which we have seen over here. Then, which you can appreciate over here, this is the anteromedial branch. Uh, basically, when we will see, there are two types of branches are there. We have the central branches and the cortical branches. In the coming slides, we will be discussing that. So over here, what I wanted to say that we have this anterior communicating artery. So uh, the anterior boundary of this circle of villus, which is by the anterior communicating artery and by the anterior cerebral artery. And when we talk about the posteriorly, the posteriorly it is uh, bounded by the posterior cerebral artery. Whereas the laterally, if you see, the laterally it is bounded by the posterior communicating artery. So the boundary of the circle of villus, when we say, I said the anteriorly, we have this anterior communicating artery and the anterior cerebral artery. Whereas po posteriorly, when we say, it is the posterior cerebral artery. Whereas the laterally on each side, you can appreciate is the posterior communicating artery. So this is the boundary of the circle of villus. Now, when you see, I said there are basically two types of branches are there. One, we have the central branch and another, we have the cortical branches. Now, when we see this central branches, these central branches arises from the circle and the proximal portions of the principal artery, right? And it, uh, what happens that these central branches, it will penetrate uh, into the uh, substance of the brain you say and it will supply the deeper structure whatever the structures which will be located into the deep and what will happen that when we talk about this cortical branches if you see over here uh, the cortical branches will arise from the proximal portion of the major cerebral arteries like we have this anterior cerebral artery the posterior cerebral artery and the uh, middle cerebral artery so what will happen that these will arise from the proximal portion of the major cerebral and the communicating arteries and it will pass into, uh, you say, in the parameter and then it will undergo the branching. We have, we will see the different uh, surfaces of the cerebrum and then we will see the different cortical branches. So it will uh, be branching and will forms the different anastomosis will be there. Uh, I will say the superficial plexus will be there and there will be a small branching which will be arising from these plexuses and will penetrate the cortex at the right angles and it will run to the variable distance. So when we see this cortical branches, these are the cortical branches of the anterior cerebral artery. When we see over here, this uh, in this diagram, the cortical branches are the orbitofrontal over here. You can appreciate over here. This is the orbital area. So initially over this orbitofrontal will cover the orbital surface of the frontal lobe. Similarly, we have the Frontopolar will cover the frontal pole. The frontal pericolasal will cover this area that is the corpus callosum over here. And then when we see this callosum marginal, that will cover the cingulate sulcus. You say over here, this cingulate gyrus is there, this area, and the frontal gyri and the paracentral lobule. So these are the different cortical branches from the anterior cerebral artery. Similarly, when we see over here, these are the major cortical branches from the middle cerebral artery. Now, over here in this diagram, you can appreciate, we have this orbitofrontal, right? That will be towards the prefrontal cortex. Then we have this pre-rolandic. Similarly, we have the rolandic over here, the anterior parietal, the posterior parietal. So according to the reason, the names have been given. So these are the different branches, the major cortical branches from the middle cerebral artery. Similarly, we'll see in the next diagram over here, we have the cortical branches from the posterior cerebral artery. Now, if you can appreciate over here, this is the anterior uh, temporal over here, you can appreciate. This is the posterior temporal towards the posterior temporal cortex. Then we have the posterior occipital in this region. And you can appreciate over here, this is the calcarine sulcus and over here, this is the parieto-occipital sulcus. So the parieto-occipital artery, and then we have the calcarine artery. So accordingly, the cortical branches are there from the posterior cerebral artery. Now, when we see the central branches, the central branches are basically, we have this divided into four groups. In this diagram, you can appreciate over here, we have this anteromedial branch, then we have the anterolateral branch, then we have the posteromedial branch, 
and similarly we have the posterolateral branch so anteromedial arteries you say uh, will be from the anterior cerebral artery and this anterior communicating artery you can appreciate over here whereas the posteromedial arteries will be from the posterior cerebral artery and then we have the posterior communicating artery similarly in this diagram you can appreciate over here we have this posterolateral branches which are from the uh, this posterior cerebral artery similarly if you see over here these are the anterolateral branches this anterolateral branches are basically from the middle cerebral arteries and uh, we need to appreciate over here that this medial straight artery is from the anterior cerebral artery over here uh, in this diagram over here you will be appreciating that what i wanted to say that this medial straight artery will be uh, from the branch from the anterior cerebral artery and which is also called as the artery of Hubner. So, and apart from that, there are the arteries which we call it as the anterior choroidal artery and then we have the posterior choroidal artery. Already I said this anterior choroidal artery which is a branch from this internal carotid artery whereas the posterior choroidal artery you can appreciate in this diagram which is a branch from the posterior cerebral artery, right? So, these are the different branches uh, you say the central branches or the cortical branches from the various cerebral arteries you can appreciate over here the in this diagram this is the medial straight artery or the recurrent artery of the cubna right we have the anteromedial branches you can appreciate over here these are the anterolateral branches from the middle cerebral then we have the posteromedial and from this posterior cerebral we will have the posterolateral -la branches so these are the different branches from the uh, you can appreciate from the circle of willis now when we see over here uh, this circle of willis this is the anterior cerebral artery you can appreciate in this i said these are the small terminal branches which runs forward you can appreciate over here right medially above the optic nerve that is the we have the second cranial nerve so it runs uh, medially and it runs above the optic nerve and you say it goes into the medial longitudinal fissure. Uh, the two cerebral hemispheres are there right and left cerebral hemispheres and in between we have, we have the medial longitudinal fissure. So this anterior cerebral arteries it runs into the uh, medial longitudinal fissure and then uh, after which what will happen that it will be connected to the opposite artery of the this you say the anterior cerebral artery via this anterior communicating artery similarly when you appreciate over here this is the uh, middle cerebral artery this middle cerebral artery i said that it is the largest branch from the internal carotid artery and i said that when you talk about the total blood which the uh, it is carrying this carotid system the 30 percent of the carotid blood will be carried by this you say the middle cerebral artery and because of that uh, apart from that one uh, that it covers the major portion of this uh, cerebrum you say is covered by the middle cerebral artery and because of that only the hemorrhage of this middle cerebral artery or the lesion of the middle cerebral artery is the is quite common very common right so it what happens that it will run towards the laterally in the lateral sulcus and then it runs backward and upwards in the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus where it divides into the various branches coming to the third important branch the main branch that is the posterior cerebral artery this i said is the branch from the uh, the sternal branch from the basilar artery what happens that when you see this uh, basilar artery it runs parallel to this superior cerebellar artery and it runs above the midbrain right so it not only supplies the posterior aspect of the cerebrum that is the the uh, you say the inferior portion of the temporal lobe and the occipital lobe but because it runs above the midbrain it also supplies the midbrain and the medial surface of the you say the cerebrum beneath the splenium of the uh, you say the uh, corpus callosum so these areas will be supplying these are the various courses of the anterior uh, middle and the posterior cerebral arteries now if we see over here in the different surfaces how these arteries are supplying so the first of all 
we'll see that either you talk about the superlateral surface or you talk about the medial surface or you talk about the inferior surface all these surfaces will be supplied by all these three cerebral arteries be it the uh, anterior cerebral artery be it the middle cerebral artery be it the posterior cerebral artery now the thing is that the superlateral uh, surface is basically chiefly supplied by the middle cerebral artery similarly the medial surface will be chiefly supplied by the anterior cerebral artery whereas the inferior surface is chiefly supplied by the posterior cerebral artery now in this diagram you can appreciate over here that the major this orange color uh, you can appreciate over here the complete reason if you see over here uh, this the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe up to this the parietal sulcus this whole area will be supplied by the uh, super uh, this middle cerebral artery right now over here you can appreciate this uh, reason you have this frontal pole right this is the supramedial surface because i said that cortical branches are there anterior cerebral arteries is basically supplying the medial surface you can appreciate over here this is the medial surface so over here the this complete portion if you can appreciate over here uh, it comes this anterior cerebral artery it comes over here it goes above covers this corpus callosum and then finally it will anastomose with the posterior cerebral artery so what i wanted to say that the medial surface the major portion of the medial surface is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery all these cortical branches will be going and while supplying this medial surface it will also go and the 2.5 cm or you say the one finger breadth towards this supramedial border from this frontal pole to the parietal sulcus this area will be supplied by the anterior cerebral artery i hope i am clear right so this portion will be supplied by the anterior cerebral artery the major portion this is the supplied by the middle cerebral artery now on the superlateral surface if you see over here this is the inferior surface the lower portion of this uh, temporal lobe and the posterior aspect the complete occipital lobe if you can appreciate over here this will be supplied by the uh, you say that is the posterior cerebral artery so these areas then coming to the the medial surface if we can appreciate we have already discussed about the anterior cerebral artery over here if you can see the basically the occipital lobe and the inferior portion of the uh, temporal lobe except this orbital part if you can appreciate right this area except this area the whole complete portion it is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery and this portion is supplied by the the middle cerebral artery that is the orbital part so i said even the medial surface it is supplied by all the three arteries that is the anterior cerebral artery chiefly and then we have the uh, posterior cerebral artery and then we have the uh, the middle cerebral artery coming to the next if we see over here this is the inferior surface now i said the inferior surface is basically supplied by the posterior cerebral artery now if you see this orbital part because this anterior cerebral artery it is traveling into this uh, long uh, this the fissure is there the medial longitudinal fissure is there so the medial part of this orbital surface is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery whereas the lateral portion right will be supplied by the middle cerebral artery whereas the major portion on the inferior surface it is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery i and this way you can see that even the inferior surface is supplied by all the three arteries be it the posterior cerebral artery be it the middle cerebral artery or be it the anterior cerebral artery so coming to the the clinical aspect of this now when you see this in this diagram you can appreciate this is the anterior communicating artery right and then we have this anterior cerebral artery so whenever there is a dilatation in the artery right there, there is a dilatation in the artery uh, usually uh, these dilatations may be the congenital right and it uh, usually it happens where the two artery joins like you can see over here this is the anterior communicating artery and this is the anterior cerebral artery so what i wanted to say is that 
this anterior communicating artery is the commonest artery where you will find uh, this this is the commonest site of the cerebral aneurysm this very aneurysm or you say the cerebral aneurysm right you can see over here the 40 percent in 40 percent cases you will find this very aneurysm or the cerebral aneurysm so i repeat i said usually these very aneurysm you will find at the junction of the two arteries over here you can appreciate this is the anterior communicating junction of the anterior communicating artery and the anterior cerebral artery so what will happen because these blood vessels are present in the subarachnoid space so whenever there is a rupture of this very aneurysm this cerebral aneurysm it will lead to the subarachnoid hemorrhage and when there is a subarachnoid hemorrhage there will be chances uh, majority uh, that the patient may not be able to survive or there will be the clinical neuro neurological deficit will be there in most of the cases in case of the subarachnoid hemorrhage the patient usually die right so this is all about the cerebral aneurysm now look at this uh, case scenario a 40 year old lady presented uh, to the emergency with transient loss of the consciousness she had developed the neck pain followed by the severe headache that is the worst headache of her life you can say after lifting a bucket of the water what happens that initially she was awake and alert but within an hour she became drowsy she has history of the poorly controlled hypertension on examination uh, she can be aroused briefly the ct the com uh, this computer tomography which you say had uh, had shown the following picture you can appreciate in the next diagram over here right in this diagram you can appreciate over here this diagram this is the uh, ct scan showing the the subarachnoid hemorrhage where these are the areas you can appreciate i said usually you will find this at the junction of the two arteries over here you can appreciate this is the subarachnoid hemorrhage similarly you can appreciate over here right so what will happen that in case of the subarachnoid hemorrhage there will be the bleeding into uh, this this space that bleeding we call it as the subarachnoid hemorrhage which is frequently caused by the rupture of the the very aneurysm you say or you say the cerebral aneurysm, uh, aneurysm. and these are basically because of the uh, injury to the cerebral arteries or you say uh, the circle of villus which is present in the subarachnoid space now when you see this uh, i said there are the different three chief arteries are there that is the one is the anterior cerebral artery another we have is the middle cerebral artery right already i said that the basically the most of the lesion you will find in the that will be in the middle cerebral artery which is commonly found most commonly found why one i said that it covers the major portion the second thing uh, if you remember this middle cerebral artery is the direct continuation of the internal carotid artery so whatever the blood flow it is coming directly into the middle cerebral artery so whatever the thrombi will be there right that will uh, directly come into the middle cerebral artery so because of that only the uh, this middle cerebral artery most commonly you will find that there will be occlusion in that so when there is anterior uh, when this anterior cerebral artery is occluded uh, you say beyond the uh, you say the uh, origin of the anterior communicating artery what will happen that it will result into the contralateral hemiplegia and the hemianesthesia so what do you mean by that it will there will be the loss of a sensation in either the lateral half of the body and basically because uh, if you see this anterior cerebral artery it supplies uh, the medial surface and i said it supplies the uh, 2.5 centimeter uh, towards the superlateral surface i wanted to say about this paracentral lobule so that area is the related to the leg and foot so basically the leg and foot will be the lower leg and the foot will be uh, affected because of the involvement of the upper part of the primary motor and the sensory areas apart from the paracentral lobule now when you talk about this middle cerebral artery when there is a occlusion of this middle cerebral artery what will happen that it will result into the contralateral hemiplegia contralateral right and not only the contralateral hemiplegia but even the same as i discussed 
the hemianesthesia. But here, uh, in case of the anterior cerebral artery, the lower leg and the foot were affected. Whereas in case of the occlusion of the uh, middle cerebral artery, basically the face and the arm, the trunk, all these will be affected. And there is a, a clinical condition we call it as the aphasia. If the dominant hemisphere is involved, right, that is related to the motor and the sensory speech area, then in that condition, there will be aphasia. So apart from that, there will be the contralateral homonymous hemianopia due to the involvement of the optic radiation. So then next, uh, when you talk about this posterior cerebral artery, when there is an occlusion of the posterior cerebral artery, what will happen that there will be the contralateral homonymous hemianopia. What I said, the contralateral homonymous hemianopia due to the involvement of the visual cortex. Because if you remember, this posterior cerebral artery is basically supplying this occipital lobe, the posterior portion, right? So because of that, uh, you will find this. And apart from that, there will be the, uh, uh, what I wanted to say, this homonymous hemianopia, that what do you mean by that actually? It is a visual field defect. What will happen that in that condition, what will happen that person sees only one side, that is right or the left side of the visual world of each eye. So that uh, we say the homonymous hemianopia, right? So these are the different arteries in these conditions. What are the conditions in which these will be affected? Now, this is the uh, diagram you can see over here. This is basically the T2 weighted MRI, right? And in that you can see the color contrast, right? Uh, which you can see the contrast. Uh, there is a color of the blue you can appreciate. You can appreciate the orange and you can appreciate the white, right? And these color from blue to orange to white, it denotes what it indicates that uh, there is a intensity, signal intensity, right? So this is uh, the middle cerebral artery. You can, whatever the orange areas you can appreciate over here in that the middle cerebral artery areas are affected and there is an ischemia. So what will happen that whenever there is a stroke, so there will be the induced infarct, infarct, infarction will be there. And because of that only this orange color will appear when you will uh, uh, do this uh, MRI. So that way you can appreciate the infarcted area you can make out. Now we will see the blood supply of the different area. Now when you see over here the diencephalon, the diencephalon it consists of the different parts. We have the thalamus, we have the hypothalamus, we have the subthalamus, we have the epithalamus. So over here you can appreciate the different arteries over here. You can, you can appreciate this artery, if you can appreciate this C6, right? This is the anterior choroidal artery, which will be basically supplying the hippocampus. Then apart from this hippocampus, it will also supply the amygdaloid body. This, uh, if you can appreciate, this is the anterior choroidal artery, which is a branch from the internal carotid artery. So it supplies the hippocampus, it supplies the amygdaloid body. And apart from that, it also supplies the parts of the uh, the pallidum and the thalamus you can see you can see you can appreciate this artery going and this is the thalamus over here so it also supplies the thalamus the you say the rostral part of the thalamus receives also a branch from the posterior communicating artery if you can appreciate over here this is the posterior communicating artery so from this posterior communicating artery the rostral part of the thalamus receives this posterior communicating artery Again, if you see over here, this posterior communicating artery, I said it is a branch from the, uh, this internal carotid artery. Now, if you see over here, this is the thalamic branch. This thalamic branch, which comes from the, uh, the posterior communicating artery and it supplies the rostral part of the thalamus. Now, these are the, so these are the different branches you can appreciate over here, which supplies the different parts of the diencephalon. Now, if you can appreciate, there is a small central branches from the circle of villus will be there and that will be supplying the hypothalamus. Similarly, there is a hypophysial artery will be there, which is a branch from the, I said the different parts of the internal carotid artery are there. We have uh, the cervical part, we have the petrous part and we have the, this uh, cavernous part, we have the cerebral part, right? There are the different, then we have the petrous part. 
So what I wanted to say that uh, when you talk about this hypothalamus, this hypothalamus will be receiving the central branches from the circular villus, and the pituitary gland will be uh, receiving branches from the hypophyseal artery, and this hypophyseal artery is a branch from the internal carotid artery. Now, next we'll see about the basal ganglia. Over here, you can appreciate this is the diagram of the basal ganglia. This basal ganglia, the most of the blood supply, if you talk about the blood, uh, this basal ganglia will be supplied by the striated branch, which arises from the proximal part of the anterior and the middle cerebral artery. Over here, you can appreciate this is the middle cerebral artery. And over here, you can appreciate is the anterior cerebral artery. So basically, this basal ganglia, when you talk about, I said that this is the blood supply to the basal ganglia will be from the straight branches, which arises from the proximal part of the anterior and the middle cerebral artery. Then in this area, you can appreciate is the middle cerebral artery. Over here, if you can appreciate this area, the green color structure, these are the, uh, this area will be supplied by the anterior choroidal artery, which is a branch from the internal carotid artery. So this is all about the basal ganglia. Then coming to the, if you can appreciate over here, this is the uh, V-shaped structure. You can appreciate this is the internal capsule. We have the anterior limb. This is the uh, genu you can appreciate over here. This is the posterior limb. Then we have the sublentiform part and then we have the retrolentiform part. So there are the five parts of the internal capsule. The anterior limb will be supplied by the straight branches of the anterior cerebral artery, right? This includes the recurrent artery of the hubner. I have shown you in the previous diagram that over here you can see this is the anterior cerebral artery. And from this anterior cerebral artery, there will be the straight branches which will be supplying the anterior limb. And not only that, even if you can appreciate over here, this is the middle cerebral artery. So branch from the middle cerebral or artery also will come and will supply the anterior limb of the internal capsule. Then coming to the genu of the internal capsule. You can appreciate over here, this straight branches from the anterior cerebral artery comes and will supply the genu, right? Similarly, if we can appreciate over here, this is the middle cerebral artery. From this middle cerebral artery, we have the branches which comes and will supply the genu. So this is uh, genu is supplied by also the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery. And apart from that, even the direct branches from the internal carotid artery will come and will supply the genu of the internal capsule. Now, when we see this posterior limb, the posterior limb will be supplied by the straight branches of the middle cerebral artery. You can appreciate over here in this diagram, the straight branches from the middle cerebral artery. Apart from that, it also uh, supplied by the anterior choroidal artery. Previously, I said that there is a charcoat artery of the cerebral hemorrhage, which is often gets injured and that leads to the death, right? So charcoat artery of the cerebral hemorrhage, which comes from the anterior choroidal artery. Over here, uh, you can see, over, uh, you can appreciate over here, this is the anterior choroidal artery, which comes, will supply the posterior limb. So I repeat what I said about the posterior limb. I said there are the straight branches from the middle cerebral artery that includes the charcoat artery of the cerebral hemorrhage. And where there is a often, chances of the injury to this uh, charcoat artery of the cerebral hemorrhage and that may lead to the death of the individual, right? Then I said we have the anterior choroidal artery. From that also, there will be the branches from this uh, to the posterior limb. This anterior choroidal artery comes from the internal carotid artery. Then coming to the uh, sublentiform part. If you can appreciate over here, this light uh, green color structure, you can appreciate this is the sublentiform part. So this sublentiform part, will receive the straight branches from the posterior cerebral. You can appreciate over here, this is the basilar artery, and these two are the uh, posterior cerebral artery. From the posterior cerebral artery, uh, there is a straight branch which comes from the posterior cerebral artery. And apart from that, there is a branch which also comes from the anterior choroidal artery. This you can appreciate the anterior choroidal artery, and it comes and it supplies the sublentiform part of the internal capsule. Similarly, you can appreciate over here, this is the retrolentiform part. 
if you can appreciate this natural lentiform part it receives branches from the posterior cerebral artery you can see over here the straight branches from the uh, posterior cerebral artery so this is the blood supply of the internal capsule now when we see over here related to the applied aspect of this internal capsule there will be when there is a lesion in the internal am i connected am i connected hello yes sir pretty much sir pretty much sir please continue right right thank you so when we talk about the applied aspect when there is whenever there is a injury to this internal capsule because all the fibers traverses via this internal capsule so even if there is a smaller injury to that what will happen the effect will be major right so whenever there is a infarction or hemorrhage to the internal capsule there will be loss of sensation and paralysis of the opposite side that is the contralateral hemiplegia and why this happens because of the involvement of the pyramidal and the extra pyramidal fibers in the posterior limb now when you see this ruptures of the charcot's artery just now i said that whenever there is a ruptures of the uh, charcot's artery there will be the cerebral hemorrhage and which is the most common cause of the hemiplegia and i said it may lead to the death of the individual apart from that there may be thrombosis of the anterior choroidal artery and that may lead to the visual or the auditory defects so this is all about the internal capsule now we'll see over here in the next diagram this is the uh, uh, diagram showing the intracerebral hemorrhage similarly if you can appreciate in the uh, blood supply about the different regions of the brain stem and the cerebellum when we talk about the blood supply of the midbrain it is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery which is a branch from the uh, basilar artery apart from that it is also supplied by the superior cerebellar artery which is again branch from the basilar artery and the branches from the basilar artery so this is all uh, about the blood supply of the midbrain similarly when we talk about the pons already i discussed that there are smaller pontine branches are there uh, from the basilar artery and these pontine branches will be supplying uh, the pons apart from that the superior cerebellar artery and also the anterior inferior cerebellar artery will be supplying the pons of the brain stem then coming to the cerebellum the cerebellum is supplied by the superior cerebellar anterior inferior cerebellar and the posterior inferior cerebellar artery the superior cerebellar artery i said it is a branch from the basilar artery similarly we have the anterior inferior cerebellar artery which is a branch from the basilar artery whereas the posterior inferior cerebellar artery which is a branch from the vertebral artery so uh, this if you can appreciate over here these are the clinical aspects the uh, applied aspect related to this there is a lateral medullary uh, syndrome we say this is because if you see over here the lateral medullary syndrome over here this region will be affected and this is because the posterior inferior cerebellar artery gets injured so it is also called as the wallenberg syndrome or it it is because of the thrombosis of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery which supplies the dorsolateral part of the medulla and the inferior surface of the cerebellum similarly when we talk about this medial medullary syndrome right this will be because of the thrombosis of the branches of the vertebral artery over here you can appreciate over there right this will be because of the thrombosis of the branches of the vertebral artery supplying the paramedial region of the medulla right so this is the medial medullary syndrome similarly this pontine hemorrhage i said there are the smaller pontine branches or whenever the artery uh, the, there will be lesion of the the pontine branches or the branches which is supplying the spons it will lead to the pontine hemorrhage now coming to the venous drainage right now when we talk about this venous drainage until unless we discuss about this venous drainage our blood supply will not be complete right so what is so special about this uh, venous drainage how it is different from the uh, venous drainage of other parts of the body when you see uh, this venous drainage of the brain right 
it basically occurs via two uh, uh, portions you say we have the superficial veins and then we have the deep veins right and the very characteristic you will uh, features you will notice over here that usually in other parts of the body the veins follow the arteries right so the veins over here when you talk about the venous drainage of the brain the veins usually do not uh, uh, follow the arterial pattern you can say right and apart from that when you talk about this veins of the brain these are thin walled and the beauty of that it doesn't have the walls right so because of that the the pressure whenever there is a increased pressure it can maintain the flow can be maintained because it doesn't have the walls so it is devoid of the walls and apart from that i said it is the thin wall right and because of that the rupture the hemorrhage is quite common so why it is thin wall because it doesn't have the muscular tissue in the wall right so these are the characteristic features of the venous drainage of the brain i said uh, it is thin wall it doesn't have the muscular tissue right in the wall then i said it doesn't have uh, the walls right so it can flow in the any direction then i said it usually it doesn't follow the arterial pattern so these are the characteristic features related to the venous drainage of the brain so what happens that these veins it pierces this arachnoid mater right and then it uh, uh, you say not only this arachnoid mater and the inner layer of the dura mater to finally open into the dural venous sinuses now what happens uh, we'll see over here in the next slide if you see over here we have the veins right there are the different kinds of veins one is the uh, cerebral veins we have the cerebellar veins and then veins for the brain stem when we talk about the cerebral veins it is drained uh, drained by uh, the superficial veins or the deep veins the superficial veins or otherwise we call it as the external veins right and the deep veins will be called as the internal veins when we talk about the superficial veins we have the superior then we have the middle and the inferior now when we uh, see this it opens into the these veins it opens into the dural venous sinuses and what happens that dural venous sinuses will finally opens into the internal jugular vein now we'll see in the next slide over here these are the superficial veins right these are the superficial veins over here when you talk about the superficial veins it will be 8 to 10 in numbers right and it mainly drains the upper part of the supralateral and the medial surface of the cerebrum which uh, if you can appreciate over here uh, this finally what happens that these veins which you can appreciate it opens into the the superior sagittal sinus you can appreciate in the diagram over here these are the superior sagittal sinus so these veins right the which drains the supralateral or the medial surface of the brain will ultimately open into the superior sagittal sinus now we have the middle cerebral veins the middle cerebral veins will be four in number two on each side when we talk about this the superficial middle cerebral vein you can see over here which lies superficially in the lateral sulcus and it drains into the cavernous sinus when we talk about this deep middle cerebral vein it lies deep on the insula when you cut and when you reflect this you will be getting the insula so what will happen that this deep middle cerebral vein will accompany the middle cerebral artery and it will join the anterior cerebral vein and finally it will form the basal vein now what will happen that this inferior cerebral vein these are small and then this inferior cerebral veins will be small and it will be so many numbers numerous numbers will be there right and it drains the lower part of the you say the either you say the medial or the supralateral surface and it finally uh, inter uh, opens into the nearby sinuses that is the transverse sinus you can appreciate in the diagram over here right so this is all about the venous drainage superficial and the uh, middle inferior and the uh, you say the middle cerebral veins now when we talk about the deep veins you can appreciate in this diagram the deep veins will be two in number on either side in the midline right formed by the union of the 
thalmostriate vein. You can appreciate in this diagram, this is the thalmostriate vein, right? And then apart from that, we have the choroidal vein. You can appreciate this uh, diagram, right? This is the choroidal vein and the thalmostriate vein. So the deep veins, which are basically two numbers, right? It will be formed in the midline by the union of the thalmostriate vein and the choroidal vein. Now, what will happen that these two veins runs posteriorly and joins under the splenium of the corpus callosum to form the great cerebral vein. So over here, you can appreciate this is the great cerebral vein of the gallant, which ultimately what will happen, it drains into the strain sinus. Basically, when you see this great cerebral vein, usually it is, uh, when you talk about the length of this great cerebral vein, it will be approximately two uh, centimeter in length and it will uh, have the tributary it will from the uh, you say the veins of the colliculi the vessel veins and the veins of the cerebellum these will be coming and opening into the great cerebral vein and finally this great cerebral vein will be opening into the uh, will be forming the you say this uh, nearby sinus now what will happen in the next if we appreciate over here just to summarize the superficial veins will drain into the superior sciatal sinus, the transfer sinus, and the cavernous sinus, right? The deep veins will ultimately form the great cerebral vein and which will join the inferior sciatal sinus to form the straight sinus. Over here, you can appreciate in this diagram, uh, this is the anterior cerebral vein. Uh, the beauty of this anterior cerebral vein is that this is the only vein in the brain which will correspond, which will follow the, and, uh, the corresponding artery. You can appreciate over here, this is the anterior cerebral artery. So it runs around the corpus callosum and drains the part of the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere. Now you can see over here, this is the basal vein or you say the basal vein of the rosenthal it is called, which is formed by the union of the anterior cerebral vein. You can appreciate over here, right? Apart from that, the deep middle cerebral and the straight veins, these, all these will join and will form the basal vein. This basal vein will finally open into the uh, the vein of the gallon and this will open into the inferior sinus, sinus which opens into the you say the anterior perforated sinus so this is all about the venous drainage of the cerebrum once again just to summarize we have already discussed so we'll skip we don't have much time uh, okay now uh, just little bit about the dural venous sinuses what happens that when you uh, see this there are the different layers or the meninges of the brain. We have the dura mater, we have the arachnoid mater, we have the pia mater, right? Now, there are the different spaces are there. We have the epidural space, we have the subdural space, and then we have the subarachnoid space. We have uh, already discussed about the subarachnoid space. Now, what happens that when you see this dural venous sinusate, it lies between the periosteal and the meningeal layer of the dura mater. Now, when you see this, uh, meningeal layer of the brain, there are two layers, uh, means the dura mater of the brain has two layers. One is the endosteal layer and another is the meningeal layer, right? Now, what happens that you have this periosteum, uh, we have this uh, periosteum, right? That will be lined by the endosteal layer. Now, what will happen that there will be some areas which will not be covered. Uh, I'll just, I don't, Okay, that diagram, let it be. So what I wanted to say that the we have this endosteal layer, right? There will be some spaces between this endosteal layer and the meningeal layer. And those spaces will be will having the dural venous sinuses, which will be lined by the endothelial lining will be there. And you have the venous blood in that. So what I wanted to say that these dural venous sinuses will be present between the periosteal and the meningeal layer of the dural meter, which will finally ultimately open into the internal jugular vein. Now, how it is flow or just, just flow chart you see over here, we have the superior sagittal sinus and we have this inferior sagittal sinus. This inferior sagittal sinus opens into the straight sinus and then it opens at the confluence of the sinus. Similarly, the superior sagittal sinus, it opens into the confluence of the sinus. Ultimately, it opens into the transverse sinus. Similarly, when we see this cavernous sinus, it opens into the superior petrosal sinus and the inferior petrosal sinus. The inferior petrosal sinus will directly open into the 
by the superior bulb of the internal jugular vein, it will open into the internal jugular vein. Whereas when you talk about the superior petrosal sinus, it will open into the transverse sinus. Transverse sinus will drain into the sigmoid sinus and ultimately it will drain into the internal jugular vein. So these are the different unpaired and the paired sinuses. Okay, now coming to the applied aspect. If you see over here in this diagram, uh, you can see, make out the different spaces over here. This is the epidural space, right? We have the subdural. Then, so what I wanted to say, whenever there is a rupture of the cerebral veins in the subdural space, it will be the subdural hemorrhage, right? And uh, most common, if you see, is the superior cerebral vein, which is caused because of the trauma, which causes stretching of these uh, bridging veins, you say, that is in the subdural. You can see over here the epidural space where there will be the rupture of the middle meningeal artery. When there is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, basically we have already discussed about the subarachnoid hemorrhage. There are cere uh, cerebral uh, aneurysm or the berry aneurysm. The commonest I said is the anterior communicating artery, which is present at the junction of the anterior communicating artery and the anterior cerebral artery. Then we have this intracerebral, that is the rupture of the charcoal artery of the cerebral hemorrhage. We have discussed about this. This diagram, I just wanted to show you the carotid angiogram and we'll have in the coming slide the vertebral angiogram also. Uh, by uh, the angiogram, uh, we can make out the how the blood is flowing or the different branches where uh, there is a lesion or the occlusion, we can make out. In the coming slide, you can see the video, uh, how this is performed. Just it is a cool video. Is the last part. This is quite a few bits of stinging. But it's worth it. Like Stinging, yeah. Well, it means I can't really feel the next bit, so it's worth it. A really thin, flexible tube, which is called a catheter, is inserted into the artery. The catheter is carefully guided to the area that's being examined. In this case, it's going to be arteriovenous malformation in Gwen's brain. Once the catheter is in the correct place, Dr. Rennie will be injecting a dye which is technically called a contrast medium, and that's injected into the catheter. A series of x-rays are taken as the dye flows through the blood vessels that are supplying the AVM. Yep, yeah, fireworks. That time it was a spreading network of flashing white lights, and it kind of looked like a growth of trees or a growth of blood vessels. Right. Very odd. Sprouting. Yes, like a sprout. IR plate is in front of my face. Oh wow, that one was like a lightning storm. Really? Yeah. More prominent on the right for some reason. Probably because you're in my right side. Yeah. It was like, yeah, lightning storm. So that was half of my tongue, half of my face on the right side, more so around my ear. No, but it felt really tight. Like I. So for me, the. So you have seen, you have just uh, witnessed over here how this is performed, right? We inject uh, into either you say in the upper part of the uh, high, you say, or even the arm or you say the forearm we inject and you have seen the procedure i'm also not an expert of that just but just wanted to have a look you uh, give uh, give a brief idea about that right now 
we'll be discussing about the blood supply of the spinal cord. Already I have discussed about this anterior spinal artery and the posterior spinal artery because when you talk about this spinal cord, the spinal cord is basically supplied by one anterior spinal artery and there are two posterior spinal arteries. This anterior spinal artery, I said, it is a small branch, right, which is formed by the union, the two small spinal branches which comes from the vertebral artery, right? And uh, you say, if you see over here, this uh, anterior spinal artery, it goes downwards. We have this anterior longitudinal teaser over here in, in the diagram. You can make out this is the anterior spinal artery, which comes from the two parts of the uh, right and left vertebral artery joints and forms this ante one anterior spinal artery, which runs along the anterior longitudinal fissure, which is present throughout. Then apart from that, we have the posterior spinal artery, uh, which is a small branch, which comes from the, either you say the uh, vertebral artery, or sometimes it may come from the posterior inferior cerebral artery. It runs along the posterolateral aspect, you can make out in this diagram. It runs in the posterolateral sulcus along the line of attachment of the dorsolateral nodes and it divides into two collateral arteries along the medial and the lateral aspect of the dorsal nerve roots. Now, what I wanted to say over here, that when you talk about this anterior spinal artery, or you talk about the posterior spinal artery, the anterior two-third part, this anterior two-third part will be supplied by this anterior spinal artery, whereas the posterior one-third part will be supplied by the posterior spinal artery. Now, when you see over here, uh, in case of the anterior aspect when you say right the minimum blood supply will be at the level of the l1 right and then apart from that we have uh, you say at the level of the uh, t4 whereas posteriorly when you see then there will be the minimum blood supply will be at the level of the t1 t2 and t3 right so uh, this is apart from that this anterior and the posterior spinal artery there are some segmental branches also and these segmental branches will be supplying this post, uh, this spinal cord now what happens that the segmental branches will be coming from the nearby branches be it either you talk about uh, this uh, cervical arteries or you talk about the thoracic branches then we have the lumbar or the sacral so uh, these what will happen that when you talk about this uh, segmental branches you can see in this diagram, there are different segmental branches. Now, these segmental branches over here, what will happen that we have this anterior spinal artery, we have this posterior spinal artery. Apart from that, these segmental artery will also support the, uh, or you say, the reinforced uh, by this segmental artery. What will happen that these segmental artery will form the five longitudinal arterial trunks. And these uh, longitudinal trunks will communicate with each other and will form ultimately the uh, plexus. We call it as the pile plexus. And what will happen that there will be the peripheral branches uh, from the same that will supply the superficial aspect of the spinal cord, right? Now, these segmental branches, uh, I said that will be branches from the deep cervical or it may be from the ascending cervical. It may be from the posterior intercostal, that is the, which comes from the dorsal thoracic right and apart from that i said the lumbar or the lateral sacral artery now what will happen that they'll, these will reach the spinal cord over here you can see the segmental arteries and they will divide into two the anterior and the posterior radicular artery over here you can appreciate these are the anterior and the posterior radicular arteries along the corresponding routes you can make out now what will happen that there are eight anterior and the 12 posterior radicular artery. And among these, the anterior is larger compared to the posterior artery. And I mentioned that, that the minimum blood supply anteriorly will be at the level of T4 and L1, whereas posteriorly, the minimum blood supply will be at the level of T1 to T3. That includes T1, T2, T3 level. Now, when you see the venous drainage of this spinal cord, it is by six veins. There are six longitudinal veins. Two will be the median longitudinal veins, one towards the anterior aspect and one towards the posterior aspect. Whereas two in the anterolateral sulcus, the, so two anterolateral and similarly we have the two posterolateral. So two anterolateral will be posterior to the anterior roots 
and two posterior lateral will be posterior to the posterior roots now what will happen that these will communicate with vertebral venous plexus and it will finally drain to the vertebral or the posterior intercostal or you said the lumbar and the lateral sacral veins which will leave the intervertebral foramen over here you can see this diagram these are the venous drainage over here so i said that these will communicates with the internal vertebral venous plexus and finally it will drain into the various corresponding areas now when you see over here when ever there is a thrombosis of the anterior spinal artery right what will happen that uh, it will lead to the uh, motor symptom that is uh, the anterior two third part of uh, will be of the spinal cord will be affected and that will lead to the loss of pain and the temperature and this happens because of the uh, injury to the spinothalamic tract you say and apart from that if you see there is a there might be condition thrombosis of the anterior spinal artery uh, because of that uh, if you see uh, there will be the motor symptoms will be there as i said and motor symptoms because of the anterior two third part is affected so this is all about there will be as i said that there will be loss of pain and temperature sensation and this is all about because of the lesion of the spinothalamic tract you will find the uh, these uh, symptoms so this is all about the blood supply of the brain and the spinal cord i i, I think it is uh, i have taken too much time it is of approximately going to be 2 hours i guess am i am i audible yeah, yes uh, yes yes yeah. uh, you are but yes you told me in the beginning itself that we we should always plan it like you know a, a time to begin and onward because the topic is it's a very very important topic for the students and as many of students you know may or may not have started the session on this particular subject so they might take a little time to understand it and there are the feedback that i'm getting is very exhaustive but yes few students have said you know that the topic has not started in our in our in our, in our college but still you know they have understood so well and you have been like quite a good you know i would say uh, a teacher here where you have made it possible to student to understand it so and very exhaustive and learning type uh, presentation thank you so much thank you so much sir and uh, so sir we'll just quickly take few q and a's which are there with me right now if you just allow me few questions sir just few questions it is uh, i'll just show you sir okay sir there are few question in terms of uh, so uh, so uh, the question is uh, so from right and right and left side of the anterior artery unites to from the basilar artery sir your 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 stem is on mute sir you have to unmute yourself sir So, so the question, I repeat the question, sir. It says so far right and left side of art anterior artery unites to form a basilar artery. No, no. Uh, this right, right and left vertebral artery will unite to form the basilar artery at the lower border of the pons. Okay, okay, okay. It is not the anterior cerebral artery. The right and left anterior cerebral artery will be communicated by the anterior communicating artery, whereas okay. the basilar artery okay. will be formed by. the right and left vertebral artery right and okay. these the right okay. and left vertebral artery will join right at the lower border of the pons it will form a uh, one artery that is the basilar artery which will run uh, in the uh, the basilar groove which is present on the ventral aspect of the pons okay so it is just the can can you please quickly repeat the branches of the vertebral artery there are five branches from the vertebral artery we have the uh, meningeal branches we have the medullary branches right we have the anterior spinal artery we have the posterior spinal artery and then we have the posterior in inferior cerebellar artery okay sir so uh, uh, any questions uh, suppose if you have a, a lot of questions uh, my email id is there with you drksravi.jipmer@gmail.com i will love to answer all your queries right any students if any queries are there d r i i'll write over here ha uh, please any more thing yes sir sir yes. there is there is requesting to can you please elaborate a little on applied aspects of uh, mca see what happens whenever there is uh, if you see this middle cerebral artery 
like I said, two arteries are there. One is the anterior cerebral artery, another is the middle cerebral artery, right? So when there is a uh, injury to the anterior cerebral artery, when there will be lesion to the anterior cerebral artery, uh, the uh, lower portion of the leg and the foot will be affected, the contralateral side. Similarly, when there is a injury to this uh, or lesion of the middle cerebral artery, what will happen? Because it supplies the portion of the head and neck region, you say the arms and the trunk. So the contralateral uh, side of the face and arm, all these areas will be affected. Okay, so great. Uh, so I would take just, so there are quite a few. Uh, okay, so what is happening? I think they must have added some questions on the chat section also. Uh, okay. So just hold on. So I'll just tell you. Uh, okay, uh, sir, uh, they, you want to uh, supply of ANCAS. Uh -huh. It is a question is at a supply of U and C U S. So it is very simple. I said if you see the uncus, it is towards the anterior part, right? So when we see this orbital part, right, towards the medial aspect, it is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery, right? And towards the lateral uh, side, it is supplied by the uh, middle cerebral artery. Towards the posterior aspect, if you see over here, right, that will be supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. So because ANCAS, if you see over here, towards the posterior side, I said it is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. So it will be supplied by posterior cerebral artery accordingly. Okay, great, sir. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll take, uh, was almost like time, but, uh, but still I will, uh, uh, Okay. So they want to know something about the supply of Broca area. Pardon? Supply of Broca's so area. That, that is the functional areas that I am thinking to have another class on the cerebral, uh, this uh, uh, cerebrum itself. So in that we will discuss about the functional. It is a very uh, long, Another lecture I'm thinking of taking on the cerebrum, and in that we will discuss about the functional areas, right? Great, sir. Great, great. Yes, sir. Well, yes. well, now that so I know, would sir... like to ask the anterior choroidal artery is a branch from which artery? Sir, uh, I think many people will not be able anyone to. You, can can anyone of you answer? Sir, so that uh... is the answer of this anterior I... choroidal artery. I... Uh, I request people to write the answer on the chat panel so I can see. Uh, and anterior choroidal branch of the anterior choroidal artery will be uh, uh, from the internal carotid artery that will be supplying the anchors. There's, there's an answer which Any says, details? yes, sir, uh, branches supply. It's the answer are internal choroidal artery. Internal carot branch from the internal carotid artery, there is a anterior choroidal artery. Yes. Branches of internal carotid yes. artery. There are five branches of the internal carotid artery, right? One, I said we have the posterior communicating artery. Another, I said we have the anterior communicate uh, this uh, uh, ophthalmic artery. Then we have the anterior cerebral artery. Then we have the this middle cerebral artery, and then we have the anterior choroidal artery, right? So these are the five branches from the internal carotid artery. Well, I could say we so have got so many GP answers GP similar GP, like this. This anterior choroidal artery will be supplying the ANCAS branch specifically. Anything sure. else? Any else branches? That you can see. Everything, these things are in the text. <laughs> sure, sir. Uh, so, sir, uh, just before I conclude the, the session, I would like to thank you, Dr. Ravi, who has taken a time again for yes. us and to be a part of this webinar, which we could not conduct due to technical difficulties last time. But yes, as Dr. Ravi promised, that we'll have much more session from Dr. Ravi and from our other authors of our best-selling books uh, in the future. And not only for 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 anatomy, I think we're going to have to have the this such webinars on different topics, uh, subjects also like physiology, biochemistry. We are planning one on physiology next week also, guys. So you will all be getting the link to join next, the next week, sir, we will, we will take a small uh, topic because it was a huge uh, uh, topic, you can say. Uh, this would have been covered in two lectures, but we tried to cover in one lecture. So we'll yes. try to, yes. so that 
uh, it will be more specific and we will concentrate better. So, because sure, sure, sure. I understand after one hour of listening, people uh, uh, means you know them, uh, they start the mental retardation and they will not be able to concentrate. So, we'll try to have next time the short topic. Sure, sir. Uh, again, I thank all my audience, my attendees, Dr. Ravi, to be part of this session. And very soon, we will have more such deliberate th these sessions in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi. And thank you so thank much, you, Dr. Sir. audience. Thank I so think uh, 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 there is a recording of this uh, lecture. Yes, sir. We will be posting uh, the recording. So because, uh, thank you so much. Very Thanks soon, so much. we will we'll put the recording on our YouTube channel and we'll provide the access. So anybody who wants to see the recording of this webinar can visit our YouTube channel in the next next, the next two days. Uh, we'll post on the YouTube channel. We can go, go, and, go and check the recording there. I thank all the participants. Uh, yes, they take, yes, uh, yes, took yes, their yes. research time and means second time also, they, I, I appreciate their patience. That second time also, they... Uh, participated in this program thank you so much for all everything thank you sir thank I, you so I, much Dr. thanks a lot thank you good evening all thank you.